Hey there, everybody. Welcome into this video. I hope you're all having a fantastic day, and I hope you enjoy watching. So in today's video, I'm going to talk about the current state of our economy, and I'm going to draw a few parallels between what we're experiencing today to what we've experienced historically throughout time in order to better understand the best actions an investor can take to set himself up for the best returns moving forward. Now, if you want to skip to that, go ahead, but this video is going to be quite long, so I'm going to jump right into it. Starting off with market sentiment, let's look at the macro first. So JP Morgan Consumer Confidence Estimate has us coming up a bit from the lows, but still near all-time lows for the index. The most recent Michigan consumer sentiment is quite the same, as you can see here. From these, it looks like people are feeling a bit more comfortable than they were just a few months ago, but let's take a closer look. Pi Investing provides a great fear and greed index for how the market is feeling at this exact moment in time. And as you can see here, we are being pretty greedy with a lot more buying activity than we had just a few months ago. The fear and greed index from CNN uses a completely different set of metrics, but has come to roughly the same conclusion. Now, I'm no short-term market analyst, but if I was, it looks like either greed is soon going to shift back to fear, and the market will continue its downtrend, which is what I hope happens so I can get better deals on companies. Or the other option is sentiment is already done, a complete 180, and folks in the market only see things getting better from here, which personally, I don't believe is very likely. But that puts us in a very interesting place. So let's look at how strong the U.S. consumer is at the moment. It's important to note that personal savings rates typically fall the lowest right before recession. As you can see from this not so beautiful picture, personal savings rates have fallen to just 2.2%. That's the amount of income on average a consumers are saving out of each paycheck. That's really not great. We were just above levels back in 2006, right before the global financial collapse happened. And you can easily see here why. I mean, you can't really blame folks for spending more just to survive. Then you can see here, total household savings are rapidly declining and the excess savings folks had back from the stimulus days is depleting even quicker. All this by itself is bad enough and the next image is just sad. It shows that debt payments as a percentage of consumer income is increasing. And in this chart, you can see that households are becoming more dependent on credit cards as they seem to be running out of savings and disposable assets. Where this becomes concerning is when you look at total credit card balances that are approaching all-time highs. Basically, we are approaching a tipping point where people are spending their savings and soon not going to be able to pay off their increasing debt burdens. And it seems to me the Fed is trying really hard to reach a fine line between a lot of people losing their jobs, but those same people not diving into financial ruin. One thing consumers do have going for them is non-farm employment is up, although this is a catch-22 since the Fed is adamantly working to lower employment with their rate hikes. Although in some industries like tech, layoffs have been coming by the thousands. Already in January of this year, Amazon announced its plan to cut 18,000 jobs, along with Salesforce announcing a 7,000 job layoff. Goldman Sachs is planning to lay off around 3,200 folks, which is about 8% of their total workforce. Citigroup, Barclays, and JP Morgan seem to be cutting underperformers. Many of the biggest banks did report earnings that were better than expected, but also seemed a bit off-put by what is to come later in the year and are battening down the hatches. JP Morgan's total loans grew by 2% quarter over quarter, while provisions for loan losses increased by 49% hinting that they think defaults on their loans are likely to increase in the near future. Bank of America had total loans increased by 0.4% quarter over quarter, yet their provision for credit losses grew by over 21%, which is a very stark contrast to the bank's behavior in 2021 when they were releasing these reserves. This, along with a few statements made by CEOs during their earnings calls, leads me to believe that they see a bit of choppy water ahead of us. Back to job cuts though, McDonald's is also discussing layoffs starting in April of this year. Now that we're talking about food, I don't wanna harp on this point too much since restaurants are always closing and opening, but I'm not sure about you, but in my area, a ton of single location or mom and pop restaurants have been closing their doors, which doesn't look like a good sign for the economy. But I recommend you take a look in the area surrounding you because I was quite surprised when I did. The next point I wanted to discuss was real estate, but I decided I'm gonna make a dedicated video 
for my analysis of real estate. So look out for that coming soon. But long story short, I believe real estate prices will decline quite rapidly over the next few months. All these points are what I'm personally seeing going forward, and I think more people should be aware of them. But enough doom and gloom. Many people, along with myself, believe that the most comparable market period to what we're experiencing today is the crash during 1980. Due to the high inflation issues, but you could also make the argument that we are experiencing some attributes similar to the tech bubble crash as well due to the smaller but still quite large run-ups that companies had in, during 2020 to 2021. Back to the 80s crash though, the funds rate likely won't reach the 1981 highs of around 20 plus percent, but the funds rate has already increased by 5,000 percent compared to the only 313 percent rise that happened in the 1980s. The Federal Reserve was very involved both then and now. Even though the leading causes were not the same, the supply constraints and inability of the Fed to control supply led the Fed in the 1980s and our current Fed to have much the same goals to increase unemployment to a level which causes demand to shrink enough to slow inflation. The stagflation that occurred during the crash didn't really occur leading to this one, and I'm fairly convinced that the high amounts of innovation in technology and manufacturing happening all over the world will aid our inflation problem today much more than it did in the past. And there's also the fact that today we have access to so much more data and we have way more access to acting on that data than we have ever throughout history. This little fact, I think, will have a huge impact on the velocity of the market behavior and is why I believe the Fed will continue compressing market positivity as much as they can until they feel demand has been curbed to what they deem a justifiable level. There are multiple pros and cons to this comparison, but still, I believe, based on my research, that our current market condition could behave quite similarly. Now, the timing of that, I have no clue, but for there being a short period of stagnation, in markets, I could see that actually playing out because we have had quite big run-ups in companies and by many metrics, there are a lot of companies still quite overvalued and particularly in the Dow, I think there are a few companies that are overvalued. Although getting to my broader point, the markets continued to fall in 1981 after the Federal Reserve rate peaked as its effects of the rate hikes loomed over the economy but began to run before the Fed chair left behind his hawkish sentiment and a while before unemployment peaked, which seems to be the case in almost every crash. Long story short, it's very much likely that markets will start to trend up before the bad news disappears, as it had back then, and quite possibly even rise rapidly as it did in late 1982. Or as Meet Kevin put it in a video he posted a few days ago, a bottom in the market could come before the Fed U-turns. And particularly one of his main points for saying this is a point I hinted at earlier. Since market participants have such a heightened awareness of the Fed's activity, it's likely that before we actually start seeing funds rate cuts, it's already gonna be so clear that they are going to cut rates that markets are already gonna have started to rebound. Continuing with the historical references, coming out of that crash, the best performing assets by far were small cap companies, which like right now, fell dramatically further and faster than many of their larger cap counterparties. With the bond markets already expecting the Fed to pivot later in this year, it seems folks have already started dipping their toes in the water when it comes to small caps, like Planet 13, Oatly, Robinhood, Neo, Smile Direct Club, and DNA, which have all jumped quite high from their lows. And hey, maybe these runs don't last, but I haven't even come close to mentioning them all, nor did I mention the potential for short squeezes, which is quite high for these small cap companies, which could boost their runs dramatically more. I definitely am not saying go out and buy small cap companies, nor is anything I ever say financial advice. Personally, I already own a fairly substantial position in small cap companies, and I'm now looking for more value dividend companies to add to my portfolio to make a more whole rounded portfolio. Personally, I'm waiting for the Dow to drop a bit more so that companies like that get a bit more attractive. Now, I don't know when or if that will happen, and I have no clue when the markets will bottom. But personally, I am continuing to spread my money out over the companies I believe have the best risk reward while also making sure I don't go too heavily into any one position or industry. Now, I'm still being pretty particular about price levels for those companies, which might be a mistake, 
but I'm trying to correct for a mistake I've made in the past where I went too heavily into some companies too quickly. So I'm working on being patient. We'll see how that works out for me. Now, this video has already proven to me that I've spent way more time this year than I should have on macroeconomics, but this little analysis was quite fun and reaching into the past for historical references can be quite informative and as long as you don't put too much weight on what you find, can be quite useful. Even though history tends to repeat itself in some ways, it in no way has to. So be careful out there and make sure you're trying to make the best decisions with all the information you can gather today. Have a great rest of your day. See you in the next one.